Uh, number one is aging. As we age, our blood-brain barrier begins to deteriorate. It becomes porous. So that anything we eat will pass through the blood into the brain. Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, all of these diseases are associated with a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. Strokes, even silent strokes, produce a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. Exposure to certain uh, pesticides, herbicides, will break down the blood-brain barrier. Uh, hypoglycemia will break it down. Uh, certain drugs will cause it to break down. Uh, free radical generation will cause it to break down. Well, we know m many of the diseases are caused by free radicals, like diabetes. You can have very high free, level, uh, uh, free radical levels. Extreme exercise, you produce a lot of free radicals. All of this breaks down the blood-brain barrier. Multiple sclerosis, autoimmune diseases, lupus, all these things are associated with the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. So we know there are millions and millions of people out there who have, at one time or another, a very porous blood-brain barrier. So when they drink a diet cola or they eat MSG, it passes right into their brain very easily. The other thing that we discovered was that even if you had a completely normal, intact blood-brain barrier, if you expose that person to a high dose of these excitotoxins over a prolonged period of time, it will seep past the barrier into the brain. The same building blocks that are found in all of the proteins that we eat, whether they be bananas or meat or peanuts or what, what have you, they are found in NutraSweet. Now, the amino acids are contained in food, but if you have protein, uh, meat, fish, and so forth, there may be 4% phenylalanine in, in the food not 50 percent. And we simply biologically don't know how still how to react to this this flooding of these enormous amounts of amino acids in the body, especially uh, the phenylalanine which crosses the blood-brain barrier that's meant to protect against uh, biologically against poisons and so forth. It's also what's called a dipeptide, that is, it is two amino acids stuck together. One of those amino acids is something called phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is the building block for another important neurotransmitter called norepinephrine. So when you take in aspartame, you'll increase the availability of one and you'll decrease the availability of the other, you'll change ratios. And when you do that, when you change ratios of norepinephrine and serotonin, you certainly affect brain function. And this can lead then to mood symptoms, to panic symptoms in some people. It'll affect seizure threshold, which is why I think I saw the seizure in this initial patient back in 1985, and why I saw a lot of seizure activity in people who were taking in a great deal of aspartame. They knew that this uh, product, aspartame, with time breaks down into a product called diketopeprazine. Uh, Diketopeprazine chemically is closely related to a carcinogenic compound that causes cancer in a lot of animals that they're exposed to it and humans. Uh, so they asked the GD Serol company to do a separate study with uh, the Diketopeprazine. Well, when they looked at this study, they found some shenanigans as well. And one of the things is when you mix up the Diketopeprazine with the animal's food, you have to homogenize it so that it's evenly distributed and the animal can't see it and avoid it. Uh, well, I've seen pictures of the feed and they left it in big clumps so the rats were eating around it, not actually eating the dicatopeprazine. There was also evidence that they were giving the dicatopeprazine uh, to the control animals. And of course this came out because in the original study they found a 47-fold increase in brain tumors. In the dicatopeprazine repeat study, they said, oh, well look, the control animals and the, and the uh, aspartame-fed animals have the same instance of brain tumors. Well, when the neuropathologist looked at it, they said, well, that's kind of strange because now your control animals have uh, a very high instance of brain tumors that's not naturally found in these mice. And then when they looked at the feed, they found out there were some mix-ups of the feed so that the dicutopeprazine was being fed to the control animals. Um, these are the sort of things that's in the Bressler report that the uh, makers of NutraSweet would not like the public to know about. 
because it's very frightening. Uh, you know, when the pathologist, uh, Dr. Adrian Gross, looked at the, the material as well, a uh, very re well regarded pathologist, and he looked at it and he was absolutely shocked. He said it's just an enormous increase in tumors, uh, particularly the brain tumors. And of course, that's exactly what we're seeing now is this uh, tremendous increase in brain tumors in this country, which is completely unexplained uh, by the neurological profession. There's also a methyl group which is found in all fruits and vegetables. Everything that we eat has methyl groups. When the body metabolizes, when it, when it breaks down aspartame, you wind up with a small amount of methanol, which is wood alcohol. That in turn is broken down into formaldehyde, which the body cannot get rid of, the body stores. Now the industry has made a big deal about uh, supposedly the, the fact, it's not really a fact, but the, what they claim is that when you take in fruit, you take in more methanol. They don't add the fact that in nature, the methanol in fruit is bound to something called pectin. Humans lack the enzyme to split the methanol off from pectin, so it goes through the body without doing any damage whatsoever. The body doesn't get exposed to the methanol because it's bound to pectin. So even though there's more of it, it's totally harmless in fruit. But in, with aspartame, you have the pure, unadulterated, free methanol and then formaldehyde. It's a small amount, but the body can't get rid of it. It's a cumulative phenomenon. So we have very, very toxic products. Methyl alcohol is just deadly and probably provides most of the, of the poisoning attributed to ethyl alcohol and alcoholics. It, it, is, it is the deadly one. Aside from the pectin story, in fruit, in nature, you also are taking in equal amounts of ethanol. You get both methanol and ethanol, and so they counteract each other. And so there's essentially no impact. You're not poisoning yourself when you take in fruit. I believe you're poisoning yourself when you take in aspartame. What's, what's the difference between methyl and ethyl alcohol? Okay, it's a difference of one carbon atom. Uh, methyl alcohol has one carbon atom, ethyl alcohol has two carbon atoms. The uh, human metabolism is geared to using carbon atoms in groups of two or three or more. Uh, when you get down to one, methyl alcohol, wood alcohol, has obligatory metabolism to formaldehyde. Formaldehyde, which is embalming fluid, is 5,000 times as potent a poison as is sipping alcohol. the FDA, which is the watchdog of American safety that we have empowered to protect the American public against food additives and drugs, has repeatedly reviewed all of the data that has been forthcoming from hundreds of studies about aspartame. Back in 1965, according to G.D. Searle, one of their researchers was working on an ulcer drug when he happened to get some of the substance on his finger and, instinctively, he licked it, noticing its sweet taste. One of the first tests conducted on aspartame was a 52-week study of monkeys to determine the effects of aspartame on primates. Seven monkeys were fed aspartame with milk. Five of those monkeys had grand mal seizures, and one died. Monkeys have a, more of a reaction to ethanol, regular alcohol like vodka or scotch. They have a real high resistance to methanol, and even though they were fed aspartame with milk, they still came down with seizures and, and, and one died of, I guess, cardiac arrest from overstimulated nervous system. Um, Searle went back and got another physician, a, a fellow named Dr. Wellington, and this guy sat down and redesigned the monkey study. In that same year, Dr. John Olney found that oral intake of aspartic acid could cause brain tumors in mice. We had this situation where the company uh, initially seemed to be responsive to the concerns and uh, they actually sent um, a team of researchers to Dr. Only's laboratory. 
and uh, they recreated the studies. The serial, re the serial investigators recreated the studies that uh, showed these, this brain damage in animals. And um, they went back to Cyril and uh, we waited to hear what Cyril was going to do about this. And the next thing we knew, uh, I would say that they probably went to Dr. Only's lab mid-71. Mid-73, they applied to uh, the FDA for a food additive petition to use NutraSweet as a sweetener. So I called the FDA and I said, this doesn't, this doesn't make any sense. Dr. Olney uh, was asked by G.D. Searle to conduct a study because there were some concerns. And it's interesting to note that these concerns came up before a lot of the major testing into the toxicity of aspartame became apparent. But my thinking as an FDA investigator is that G.D. Searle already knew that going into this. Ultimately, FDA, using its good offices, interestingly enough, a major person there, created a meeting between me, uh, uh, Cyril and General Foods, which was going to be one of the main customers. And we met. And um, I said I didn't think that this would ever reach the market. And they said, well, they were sure it was going to be approved. And I thought that we were on 180 degrees opposite sides. It turned out that it was approved, but FDA asked them not to market it. And they held it up so that there could be hearings and so forth. In 1974, the FDA approved the limited use of aspartame. Do you know why they were sure it was going to be approved? You said that they they said that it was sure that they. It was well, see, see, when I said I don't think it's going to re read the mar reach the market, I was being very particular, but I didn't believe it was going to be approved because the evidence didn't show. They said it was. Now, now, one uh, very strange fact in all of that is that I knew that they had the brain damage study from Olney's lab that their own people had done. And we talked about the various pieces of evidence that uh, were problems. And I finally said, what about the brain damage problem from the animals in Dr. Olney's laboratory that your own people have gone and looked at? And he said, we don't think those are going to be a problem. Well, it turned out they weren't a problem because they didn't give them to the FDA. So, so here they had in their own files a study that raised very serious questions that they did not give to the FDA. That's a violation of law. G.D. Searle did not inform the FDA of this study until after aspartame's approval. This approval came despite the fact that FDA scientists found serious deficiencies in all tests related to genetic damage. And so